Hello everyone, my name is Sugita and today's uh, tutorial is about digital principles. Um, so I'll be talking to you about what to consider when you designing your when you are designing your portfolios and uh, general principles behind digital content and how to make the most out of your work when you have to present it uh, in a digital format. And obviously this applies not only portfolios but anything else you do. Um, but I'm using a portfolio as an example because that is what all of you will be doing this year. Uh, I will start with showing you an example portfolio from last year's students. Um, I've picked this portfolio because it contains some of the principles I will be talking to you and it demonstrates them. It doesn't mean that your portfolio should look like that. Um, I'm using this example just to demonstrate um, why it is important to follow these principles and how to actually uh, make an impact with your work and make it um, you know, memorable. Uh, and then I will also talk about principles such as file type, sizes, resolution, uh, differences between um, different screens and how your portfolio is actually viewed. Uh, I will also talk about some color profiles um, and which ones you should set up and how you should set them up for your drawings to make sure that there is consistency and that you choose the right one for the screen. And afterwards uh, I will touch upon some basic design principles such as layouts, grids, fonts, colors, and that kind of stuff. Um, afterwards I will take you to InDesign and I will show you how to set up a basic portfolio template uh, in InDesign with some of these principles in mind. So this is the portfolio I've chosen to show you which was done by CPU students last year and these are six year students so this was their final portfolio um, and I will just quickly flick through it and show you what what it looks like and why I like it. So as you can see from just the first couple pages there is a very strict color scheme so they do they have chosen a couple of colors and they're sticking beside them so all the pages there is consistency between the pages um, and also when you look at a page for example this one you can very clearly see what they've been trying to communicate it doesn't have too much unnecessary information when you look at it you see overview as a title so you know this is the overview page and going forwards, every every single page is labeled and identified what is actually on the page, which is very easy for me, the reader, to go through it and uh, see what what I'm actually looking at. Uh, obviously, depending on how your uh, what your requirements are, you can't always um, you might need to stick to a certain number of pages, for example. So you can't always just make these uh, nice big pages with like one sentence or like one big picture on them, because obviously you need to make sure that you stick to your requirements as well. Um, however, even when you have a busy page such like this one for example, you can still see that there's clear hierarchy on what is on the page. There's only a couple sentences so I can read through them. Um, I can instantly understand what this is about because they have put a title and they have put a subtitle. So in this, one, this page for example, they're talking about mental health and this particular one is on statistics. And obviously then, if I'm interested in something, I can always go through and read what they actually said. Um, and then going forward, as you can see, there is consistency and there is... And uh, not every page is the same in a sense that the layout stays the same or they, they stick to a certain layout, but there's still some difference between how each page looks, which is great for... just so it doesn't get boring. And also another interesting thing to notice is that um, even though obviously you follow a certain process when you design your projects, your portfolios, your uh, proposals, you don't always have to present them in the way you did them. Because obviously sometimes you might come back and you might realize that there are some bits missing or the way you tell your story is in a different order from how you did your things. So make sure that you don't just stick things together one after the other the way you produce them, but actually go back and reiterate through your proposal just to make sure that the reader also can follow through your narrative. Um, another important thing to note is that, for example, in this one, uh, so in this portfolio, even though it starts with the background stuff that they did and the research behind their actual final proposal, as they go through it, you get, uh, throughout the portfolio, you get some glimpses about, like this one, for example, of how the actual final thing looks like. So you're not just looking at a bunch of diagrams, um, or in a bunch of site analysis without any other context. So you actually see that, okay, so this is the thing that they're they're going to present at the end, but actually you already get a glimpse of insight in uh, how it's going to look 
even even before you've actually reached that stage, the final stage of final renders and visuals. Also this way, when you present, um, when you space out some of your best visual work uh, with some probably more uh, technical stuff in between and stuff that is not necessarily that visually appealing, you end up making your portfolio more interesting. And So it means when you actually get to the final pages or the final section of the portfolio, which is talking about the actual project proposal, when you see this image, it doesn't just come out of the blue. You actually have already been introduced to some bits of it ahead of it ahead of time. And also this way, when you have a couple of striking visuals and you don't put them one after the other, you make more impact with them because you s if you see four great visuals one after the other in your you know in, in your head, it's kind of like just okay, these are these are the visuals. They are pretty, but. What's the point? Whereas if you actually uh, space them out with some consideration for how it is all laid out and when people see what, you can actually control the narrative of your portfolio. Um, and that is that's obviously very important. Another thing that they have done is made some interactive content in their portfolios, which I know not everybody is allowed to do and not everybody is asked to do, but if you do have interactive elements, like they have a video, you actually want to make it noticeable in your portfolio. So here it clearly says click to view the video and there's a play button. So when I hit, uh, when I click it, it will take me to, I believe, an external link, uh, something on, for example, this one, it's on, uh, it's on Google Drive. And obviously it will op open up video and then I can actually go through um, the content and I can always return back to the original portfolio file. Uh, you can also embed uh, videos and interactive content straight into InDesign, but sometimes because of the file resolution, uh, file, sorry, file size, uh, it's not always possible because it will just take your portfolio over your limits. However, by doing it this way, you can link stuff if it's important to external stuff. However, you should always check whether that is allowed and encouraged because different courses might have slightly different requirements and opinions on this. Um, and just to finish off, I will go out um, from full screen mode and I'll show you how when you look at the pages, an overview of all the pages, you can see that when I look at them, that it's clear that this has been done, every page has been done by the same person or in this case by the same group of people because there is consistency in color, there's consistency in layout. However, not every page looks the same, which is a very important point I'm trying to make. There is, even though the layout is the same, they have consistency in where the text goes and where the page numbers go or section numbers go on each page, you can see that on some pages there is more there is more text, in some pages there is more diagrams, in some pages there are some full, full size images, there are some pages with more complex detailed images and obviously that makes the portfolio interesting and to me, the reader, it makes it more, um, it, it, it makes it easier for me to go through it and makes it easier for me to read, which is obviously great for when this is the way your, your portfolio is what is actually presenting and selling your work to us, uh, your tutors, as well as uh, when you go out looking for a job uh, and just when you showcase your work as such. And now, having gone through that uh, example portfolio, I will go through some of the digital principles I mentioned before and talk about them in more detail. Uh, so obviously the first one to consider always when you're making a portfolio or anything else, you should consider your audience in the sense that who is looking at it, how much time they have, and how are they looking at your portfolio. For example, whether you're, whether you're submitting a print version of a portfolio or if you're submitting on screen, which somebody might potentially view on a very small laptop screen, there is a difference in, for example, font size or how big your images are or how many things you just put on a page. Uh, and obviously there is difference in file sizes and resolution, which uh, comes from these considerations. But you should just always be mindful of how, just try and imagine how the person looking at it will, will take it and how they will view it. Um, and obviously this year most of our, well all of our submissions are going to be online, so there is, uh, you can make, make use of it and make your sheet size the same as, for example, a screen size, so you don't waste some space around it just by doing it as an A3 or A4, unless you're obviously asked to do it that way. Uh, so for example, standard screen size would be, um, like a high definition screen would be 1920 by 1280 pixels, so why don't make your uh, pages, for example, that size, making sure that you make, make most of every pixel you have available to you. 
And obviously another thing to remember is how long will actually your the viewer have to look at your particular portfolio. Um, because it can be that you have done a lot of work, but you need to make sure that every page you do communicates exactly what you're trying to say. You can do this by uh, reading through your titles and subtitles and actually making sure they do respond to what's on the page and uh, highlighting some pieces of text and stuff I will talk about later on. So to start with, uh, I'll talk about image file types because that is one of the most important thing you need to learn and understand to make sure that your portfolio image qualities don't compromise your work. So there's two main, well, there's two image types. Um, there's raster images, which are uh, images which are made up of tiny little squares of color, and each each square of color, uh, each square represents a certain color, and then obviously once you combine those squares, uh, you end up with a picture. Uh, so this is most photographs you take, or this can be uh, stuff you do in Photoshop and so on. Uh, and these images, these pictures are great for obviously colors and taking photos. However, you need to remember that the image quality is only that of how many pixels you have in that image and you can't zoom into them because at some point they will just start getting uh, grainy and you, there's a limit to how, how far you can zoom in before you lose quality of uh, what you're seeing. Uh, on the other side we have vector images which are images made out of points and lines and fills. Uh, a vector is by definition a line with a direction so it's, it has a starting point and it has a direction in a three-dimensional or two-dimensional space if you're drawing and it has uh, and it has a length and that and because of those properties it is scalable meaning that whether you uh, would take this image of uh, this picture of uh, um, building that I've drawn if you printed it in a small postcard or you made a massive poster the lines would always be crisp and they would always be the quality would retain because of the way the vector files work um, which is why you should always think about when you do your diagrams you need to make sure that the majority of them are done as vector files and also this goes for text because text if it's uh, embedded for example in an uh, illustrator file or an indesign file it, it comes out as a vector meaning that if you scale it up or down it will never look grainy and pixelated whereas if you do your text in Photoshop it, it will not come out great because Photoshop is a pixel uh, it's a raster based software so it will basically turn your text files into pixels and at a certain resolution it will just start losing quality. Um, so I've already spoken about some of the characteristics of image file types but um, I'll just go go through some characteristics here on the screen just so you can take, take notes and you can uh, reference it later on. Uh, as I said comment file types for raster images would be JPEG images, so it's all the photos you take, um, PNG files which allow transparency, Photoshop files and so on, whereas vectors are illustrator files and some other files which uh, I will mention. So uh, an important thing to highlight is that PDF files can be both raster and vectors. So for example if you make a drawing in Illustrator and you export it as a PDF, um, it will obviously uh, it will obviously be a vector scalable file and you can scale it up and you don't lose quality whereas if you just save a Photoshop file as a PDF it is still a, it's a still raster based pixel image so you, you it won't magically just turn into a vector just because it saves this PDF so it's a very important distinction to know. Um, and to, to talk slightly more about the different types of types of files because it does affect the quality of the image and also it does affect the uh, size of the image, which is obviously important when you have a limit for your portfolios. Uh, so JPEGs are the most common uh, raster or pixel files, which are the photos and stuff like that. And you should, uh, while it is a good format to use, you should remember that if you do compress it um, in order to reduce size, you will it will affect the quality and it's very difficult to compress JPEG files. So if you have a large uh, photo which you want to make smaller, you need to make sure that you don't compromise the quality of it. Uh, TIFF files, it's sometimes also spelled as TIFF, uh, they're great for, they are a type of um, raster files which are uh, which are great for scanning, which are great for um, documents which contain a lot of detail because, because these files will 
uh, retain most quality. However, that means that those files will also be large in size. So if you do have, uh, if you go to archives and you scan stuff, and if the scanner has great quality, you you would want to save it as a TIFF file because it will allow you to then gather most information from that scan file rather than if you if you save it as a JPEG. Uh, however, once you have worked on the document and you output it, you might want to save it in a different format just for that output, just to make sure that actually it's compressed and uh, doesn't take up that much space. Uh, .psd are Photoshop files, so those are the raster files that you create in Photoshop and they do preserve layers and editing you have done, so obviously once you once we do talk about how to work in Photoshop and how to do all this, you will save them as PSD files as you work in them, and they do tend to get quite large, but that's why you can always export stuff as JPEGs, as PNGs, PDFs, and so on. Um, and the last file that I want to note is uh, PNG files. So one important part, one important characteristic of PNG files is that it does support transparency, meaning that if you have transparent um, parts of your picture, it will it will preserve them as a PNG file. And also when you compress stuff in PHG, uh, sorry, PN, PNG, it does um, compress better, meaning, meaning that you lose less, uh, you don't lose that much quality as you would do if you do a JPEG file. And obviously with these things, it's always important to just test them yourself and uh, to see how they work and what you can do with them. Um, and note on vector files, so .ai would be Illustrator files and they're great for preserving all editing capabilities that you have in Illustrator. However, you need to know that they are version dependent, meaning that if you do create stuff in an old, in a young, uh, newer version of Illustrator, some older Illustrator software might struggle to um, open it and read it properly. And the same around, if you save something to be read in an old, in an older Illustrator version, it might sometimes compromise some of the more uh, newer functionality that you might have used in your drawings. Uh, EPS files are great for sharing with basically anybody who um, uh, who uses different type of vector software because they will most likely be read by anything and uh, they do not preserve all the um, all the layers and editing and stuff like that that uh, AI files do. However, if you, for example, are sharing uh, something small like a logo or an icon, EPS is always a good way to go because you will make sure that everybody can read them. And a similar file format is an SVG, which is um, how you can export your AI files if you want them to be read, uh, be available to be open on a web browser. Uh, they can be integrated into web pages, and they are still vector files, and they support editability and uh, all that stuff that comes with creating stuff in Illustrator. And of course, uh, you can export stuff from Illustrator as PDFs, which is great for when you want to share. For example, you're working on a drawing in Illustrator and you want to share it with somebody who does not have the software, you can always export it as a PDF and uh, it will preserve quality and it will also preserve some Illustrator editing and obviously it will be, you'll be able to open the file in basically any software that reads PDFs. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about InDesign files in the next tutorial, however, there's two main ones. So there's .intd, which is the standard InDesign format, but it does the but it is very version dependent. So if you create stuff in a newer version of InDesign, for example, you are sending it to somebody else to work on who has an older version of InDesign, they won't be able to use it, which is why you need to use uh, .idml files, which you can export or save as in InDesign, which is um, which loses some of the links and it loses some of the uh, post some of the stuff that you might have done in your InDesign files. However, Anybody with InDesign will be able to use it uh, and open it in any InDesign version. Obviously, you can always resave it as a working InDesign document and uh, and so on. So the next thing I will talk about is uh, resolution and file sizes. So when you do, um, so when you present stuff on screen, which is what you will be doing this year, uh, you might have heard about DPI or dots per inch, which is uh, stuff you use normally for printers. And it does not matter that much on screen sizes. However, uh, what you do want to consider for screens, it is the entire number of pixels you have in your image. So for example, as I said, this is only applies to um, raster graphics, which actually do contain pixels because for vectors, you can scale them indefinitely and 
uh, it's just more about how much you put on the page before it becomes unreadable, it's just too big for the page. Whereas for, um, for raster images, you want to consider the image size in terms of how many pixels it has, because the screens, while screens do have pixel uh, DPI resolution, what matters is the total number of pixels the s your screen or display is capable of presenting. So if you're, so if you, for example, want to do a, for a full size image um, to be viewed on a on a 1920 pixel wide screen, which is uh, one of the standard sizes, you want to make sure that your image is set to at least that. Well, actually, precisely to that pixel uh, width. And on the other hand, there is no there's really no um, need to make it much larger because your screen is just your screen won't be able to uh, show the difference between the 1920 and let's say 3000 pixels wide because the screen will only use the pixels it has available to it and obviously compression does matter so even if you do have a raster file the way you save it and the way you set your settings can affect the overall quality of how the image looks at the end uh, and just to reiterate, uh, which is why I would suggest using vector graphics wherever it's possible, so for diagrams, for any text you have, do not add it on Photoshop, add it on InDesign or Illustrator. And same goes for, uh, so yeah, CAD drawings also can be exported as vector files, which you can then uh, obviously display in uh, your portfolios uh, or use them in InDesign and Illustrator to um, edit and so on. And obviously you should always test your outputs so if you save something, Make sure you check it on your screen. You can always ask your friends to test it on their screens and like see how it looks to make sure you, nothing is pixelated, everything is crisp and clear, and you do not compromise your own work just by accidentally making it too small for, for the screen and so on. Um, whereas for print files, DPI, which is uh, dots per inch, uh, which measures how many pixels a printer can print on in one inch of uh, paper space, so and one inch is 2.54 centimeters, it's just um, most printers will use uh, per inch rather than per millimeter or per centimeter. Uh, and here it is important to remember that you, you want to make sure that your document matches the resolution of the printer. So if your printer only prints at 150 dots per inch, you really, there's no need to make documents which are much uh, more pixel dense because the printer just won't be able to uh, make that resolution anyway, so there is no need to waste space on your on your computer and your, on your files only because um, you want to set it on high resolution, always make sure these things uh, these things match and you use common sense to just develop your uh, portfolios and drawings. So just uh, a note on different screen sizes and resolutions, so as we can see here uh, this is a comparison of different types of screen you might you might have and you might use um, you might use for your work or your tutors might use for grading your work so for example here we have um, so where is it uh, so yeah the high definition screen so it's 1920 by um, 1080 which is one of the more standard sizes and you can always test your laptop and see what the screen resolution is on that or your computer um, and for example, the one I'm using at the moment is uh, is this format, is 2560 by, well it's actually by, oh no, it's this one, by 1440. Uh, and the highest resolution you can probably get is a 4K screen, which would be a massive TV, which would have, uh, which would be 4096 pixels wide. Uh, obviously there are screens which are bigger than that, but uh, just to think about standard and what people might be using to do your work, there is really no need to make anything much larger than that size because this is the maximum number of, pixer, of pixels across uh, your screen will be able to display so if your image is more than that just make sure you reduce the, the actual width of in pixels because that will affect the file size that will make it will just make your portfolio smaller in, in uh, size and it will and you, you will be able to make uh, add more high quality images rather than reducing the quality of everything together um, so I already spoke about file size, but I will just make some um, some final comments on, on that um, area. So if you have made your portfolio in design and you export it and it is it comes out as too large for your submission, 
go back and check your heavier images. So you can always see in the, uh, I'll show you on the list, list of images later on how, how large the files are. And as I said, if your images are massive in resolution, you might just want to go back and actually change, um, change the actual image rather than try and uh, compress the entire uh, portfolio. If you do that, and if everything seems to be fine, then you still get file that is too large. Uh, you can use software such as uh, uh, Adobe Acrobat DC or Acrobat Pro in an older version uh, to, re uh, to reduce it. There is an option to export it as a reduced sized or optimized PDF. Um, and obviously, as the very last option, if you just if you try everything and your file is still too big, you can try online services such as Small PDF or others to um, let them to compress your document, which will usually give you quite good results. However, you can't control the way it compresses it, so you, it might just the result might not be as great as you could do it if you understood and uh, checked all your file sizes and all your document setups manually. And so the next thing and the last thing in this uh, small section I would like to talk about is color profiles. So the two ones I want to highlight are the CMYK and the R RGB color profiles, which are different ways of how different things essentially create color that you can see. So CMYK is um, colors that are used by printers to mix all other available colors. So if you have an ink um, or a laser colored laser printer, you will see that it has four cartridges, which are the four colors that um, by combining they do create all the other colors. Whereas the RGB is um, a color model used to reproduce colors on in electronic systems, TVs, computers, um, lights, that kind of stuff. And they do combine from red, green, and blue which, blue, which are the primary colors in RGB spectrum. And when you combine them all, the color that you get at the end is white. Whereas obviously in CMYK in a print, the combined total color is black. Uh, this is important because when you do, um, if you have stuff that is in two different color schemes, uh, in, in one of those two uh, color models, it can look different um, when you do on screen or when you do as a print. So if you are preparing stuff that is primarily for printing, you would want to use CMYK because it um, it will have less colors available. However, they will have more accurate representation of how it will look on print. Obviously, it will also depend on your printer settings and stuff like that. But if you have stuff in RGB and then you want to print it, you might notice that colors will look way different in print because uh, simply printer won't be able to recreate all the color information that RGB contains. And also if you need one document, for example, if you do in uh, a document in InDesign and you have uh, drawings coming from the two different color profiles, you will end up seeing differences, which uh, I might talk about later on, but uh, the main one will be that you will just need to switch, uh, resave your documents into the right color spaces so they do look consistent and you don't lose some, some of the color definition that you have set up. Uh, the next section is on design principles. So this is very, very basic uh, general introduction to what, what you should consider and how to make a portfolio look good. Um, the first thing is layout. Um, obviously you want to have a grid, which is uh, a baseline um, setup of your pages where you can where you can then make sure that all your text, all your images, all that stuff is aligned and it does follow some sort of uh, three by four or like a column uh, setup or just a full page thing. And you have your margins and gaps and everything set up so everything is always consistent, which is what makes uh, the final the final um, document look nice and refined and crisp. And also what you consider in your layout is your narrative and your story and how does it fit in the whole thing and wha how you actually see it and then when you open the page what is the thing that you're drawn to because that will be what your reader sees first and what they essentially judge first. Um, so if it is if it is something important that you're trying to convey with, with your drawing make sure it's highlighted, it's big, it's visible and you do not bury it under other stuff which is probably less relevant and might actually not need to be on that particular page. Um, and double check your titles because if somebody is looking at your portfolio for the first pl for the first time and they're not familiar with your work, um, you want to make sure that your title and your subtitle responds to exactly what is on the page. So 
if my page is about um, some background data, I just call it <laughs> background data and do not try to be too um, vague with your how you name your page and your subtitles because that helps the reader to build up the narrative and follow through and actually see what you're talking about and how it all um, adds together to the final, final, final stuff in your portfolios. And of course, always check whether the page layout you have chosen looks good and is readable on screen. So if you have vertical pages, make sure there is a reason why you have them vertically or just change them to horizontal pages. At the same time, you can, s for some, um, for sometimes publications, some people do export them as spreads. However, again, you need to make sure that even if it's a spread of two pages and it might look nice altogether, is it still readable if you open it on a small laptop screen so that the person who is reading it doesn't need to zoom in and out all the time because that just gets uh, inconvenient and it might affect how it is viewed. And of course, uh, another very important thing to remember is the white space. So you don't always need to crowd your pages with everything everything you've done and everything you want to put on there. And sometimes it's good to take, st st take a step back and look at how if you want to emphasize something on your page, maybe it's good to leave some space around it. And the same goes for your, not just your pages, but also your drawings and uh, utilizing white spaces and having some constraint when it comes to how you lay out your pages is actually quite a quite a, quite an important thing to, to learn and to do. Uh, leave some sort of like breathing space for your space if you, if you must to, uh, so the reader can actually absorb the important thing on it and it's not just overcrowded with all kinds of things. And it also comes not just the white space, around one image, but also, for example, space between diagrams. If you pile them together too closely together, um, you might want to come sort of like take a step back, look at it and make them all smaller so there's more space between them so that your eyes can actually follow each single thing and it just doesn't just turn into like one big, one big blur. Um, and another thing that I think already highlighted when I was going through um, the student's portfolio from last year, uh, Consistency is important, however, you don't want to repeat every single page to look exactly the same as the previous one. So if you do have a page which has, um, let's say, like a large title or like um, an image and then a large description, you want to make sure that not every single page after that is the same layout. So you want to, have, uh, you want to sort of like choose between pages which are more text heavy and more image heavy and large images versus small images diagrams versus uh, two-dimensional stuff versus three-dimensional stuff, uh, diagrams versus renders, um, and again, text and no text. Because it's if you look at this, for example, layout example I just pulled up here, it's you can obviously see that there's consistency in proportions, how the pages are laid out. However, there's still options within those proportions and constraints to make it interesting and make sure that if you do have a nice large image which you want to display in the page, you leave it enough space around it, you make sure it is, it is a focal point. Whereas if you have a series of diagrams somewhere, you use a different layout where you can actually display that particular uh, concept. And uh, remembering about, I think I said at the beginning about the narrative of your portfolio. So does it actually, does it tell the story? So if you go back and look through the pages, does the, the way you have constructed the narrative throughout the portfolio for somebody who has never seen it, will they be able to understand and follow through what you're talking about and what, you, what is it you are presenting there? Um, and just to reiterate, that obviously, you don't need to present stuff in the order that you did it unless you have been specifically asked to do it. You should take everything you have produced, look at it and see actually in what particular order it would be, it would be best um, representative of what you have done. And which is also why you probably shouldn't put all your best images at the end of a portfolio because you might you might want to start with well you actually should probably start with a strong visual and then you have some background stuff then you have a strong visual again so that it's uh, engaging for the reader and so that I don't need to wait for 100 pages until I get to the final page to actually see what how your design looks like you, you want to make sure that you you kind of um, follow that and when you're looking at it it's interesting all the way through and you give gl glimpses of stuff that's to come. Um, like, you know, when, when you watch a film, you want to, you don't just uh, see the, the main character at the end, you actually, stuff gets introduced throughout the film and, you know, it builds a story all together, which is kind of like how you can think about your portfolio. Um, and also, uh, 
importantly, what I said about the white space and the layout, give readers some space to breathe and give them a break. So if you do have a page which ha contains a massive diagram with loads of uh, different things going on, then maybe the next page shouldn't be another diagram of, of the same sort unless they relate to one another. You may, might want to put in a page that is slightly less heavy uh, in terms of information that's in there so the reader can um, can just relax and kind of like absorb the image and then go back into reading stuff. Uh, whereas if you do just um, put in text after text after text, you will realize that the, the person who's reading it just gets can get tired and they can lose attention, which will mean that they will miss out some probably very important parts that you're trying to uh, tell in your portfolio. Um, and yeah, I will talk about text and highlights also in a minute, but if you do have large chunks of text, you might want to read through it and highlight the stuff that is really important. So even if I have 10 seconds look at your page, I instantly know what you are trying to say, what is important about it. And uh, last but not least, if you have some interactive content in your pages, which has become sort of like more popular, especially now when uh, all the portfolios are uh, online and um, you want to use different types of media to do your work. If you do have some interactive stuff, so for example, you have stuff that is overlaid in a page where you can click through different types of drawings on one page, or you have external links to videos, or you have embedded videos, which are indeed videos, not just still images, don't be subtle about the way you highlight them. Make sure you do have a massive arrow, you have a massive circle, you have a play button, and you have text in, well, red or whichever color you choose, but so that if I'm reading your portfolio and I'm not familiar with it, and I, and I don't know that you have this video in there, make sure to say this is a video. Click play to view the video or add the YouTube link or whatever you have been asked to do uh, in the way you are um, presenting it. And uh, coming back to layout, visual hierarchy, which is um, the way you do deliver your content, not just as a narrative, but also on your page so that you actually create uh, meaning and impact of your work. So this is a very uh, interesting concept to look up and there's loads of stuff online. I might post some uh, useful links down as well. But basically what it uh, what entails is that you should make sure that the way it's laid out, your page, like as I said, like if there is something, like if, if you have two diagrams, one of them is a very important diagram and one is a very, it's so like a background diagram just showing something, uh, like one thing, you don't want to make them both the same size on the page. You, wa you want to make the important diagram the focal point and then the one which has some background information. Like for example, you have some a side diagram and you just have a location diagram. You you can make the location one smaller if it only ha is one dot on the map. Whereas if you have a side diagram which has six, seven layers of information on it, you will want to make it bigger just so it, it has that impact and it actually draws the attention on it. And you also can uh, remember that when when people are reading your pages, the normal read patterns are the Z or the E pattern. So the Z pattern is I start, I look at the page and I sort of like scan it through as like a big letter Z. So you want your title or your important stuff on top and then sort of you scan through and then there's stuff at the bottom. Uh, or the same, a similar pattern is the E pattern. So when somebody would read, they would look at what's what's here on the page and they go down and they sort of like, you know, go across and they go down and they go across, which is, um, more, I guess it more applies to uh, vertical layouts, but just think about that, like when you, even when you test yourself, when you open like a news page or like anything on the internet, see where your eyes are drawn to first and whether that's a good thing or not, and that's how you can sort of like check your portfolios if, when you open the page, if the reader is drawn to what's actually important on the page. Um, uh, on the practical side, always remember when you have drawings at scale bars and you add your um, and you do add them especially in digital submissions because obviously screens can be different sizes but there is still difference in uh, how drawing scale um, how the scale looks so if you do have a plan drawing it doesn't matter if I'm looking if like one, one to 100 plan drawing it doesn't matter if I'm looking at it um, on a massive screen or if I'm looking at it on a print on a postcard it's still the level of information in a one to 100 drawing will be different than let's say one to two uh, one to 20 sections so uh, just to pulling out uh, some stuff from the portfolio I showed you. So there's obviously a large, some like 1 to 1250 uh, scale location drawing, for example, but then uh, which only shows you where the building is with its immediate context or like wider urban context. 
uh, and whereas the 1 to 100 or 1 to 200 plan would already have some idea of spaces, so what is closed, what is open, what kind of furniture you might have in there, um, and other de other types of detail, and obviously when you go even further down to 1 to 20 or 1 to 10 detail, you can actually show the fabric and how it's built up with all the little um, layers that you have in your in your building fabric or in your floor slabs and then you have your details your even like your bolts and nuts and that kind of stuff and as you can see here obviously they're all the same size on the page but each of them conveys different type of um, different level of detail and you shouldn't lose that just because your submission is digital you still need to think about your scale as the level of representation of what you're actually doing um, yeah that's the transformation portfolio I showed you earlier uh, and now a note on fonts so you can it's it's a topic that obviously it's, it's a subject on its own, but just to kind of give you some um, idea of how to think about it is when you're reading something, if you if you have a highlight or or a title of your page with just a couple of words, you can be bold and you ca you want to draw attention to it in most cases. So that's uh, when you choose bold fonts, uh, which can be quite graphic, quite sort of like poster like because that's only a couple words people read and you want to make the in impact, whereas if you are writing uh, larger paragraphs of text you might want to choose a font that's actually readable um, and there's also, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what fonts to use or what fonts not to use, but just think about it like when you when you're looking at a page or you're reading a book, like what, how, what makes it readable is you know the way the font is laid out, the gaps between uh, between the lines, line spacing and that kind of stuff, and also uh, for example here in this particular font, it's a serif font. So you will see uh, if you go for if you go looking for fonts online, you will see there is usually serifs and uh, serif or sans serif um, fonts. So serif is based. Serifs are those little, um, you know, like little bits added to letters, which when you read, like you can see, there's for example, letter R has like a little leg, and then like um, letters uh, like D and B and L have those sort of like little, I don't know, like elements to them little uh, like legs or something um, and what it does it basically when you read text especially when it's larger uh, if you read a newspaper or a book or something you will usually have serif fonts because it allows the reader to um, visually pull the words better together and it actually allows you to read text more efficiently um, I'm not saying that all text has to be in uh, in serif fonts there's loads of sans serif fonts which are great like I don't know Helvetica for example is not a serif font but it's very commonly used and it is very readable Again, I'm not saying you should use Helvetica, it's just an example. Uh, whereas, obviously, this font, this font, I think it's called Impact. It's um, it's large, bold font, and it's it's nice for title because, you know, it, it, it leaves an impression. However, imagine if I had a whole book written in this font, it would be borderline impossible to read it, and I would get tired very quickly. Um, and just as a, reg as a general rule of thumb, I would suggest to not overdo it with fonts, like less is more, and if you have one or one or one type of font for your titles and the other one for your text or your annotations, that's that's plenty. And you can always stick to the same one uh, typeface. So, for example, the one I'm using here in this presentation, um, it's the same font, but it has uh, options in typefaces, which are bold, regular, thin, medium, and there's probably light and extra light, and then there's um, light italic and that kind of stuff. So you can you can just go through these and uh, see if maybe that's how you add highlights or you change uh, what what type of text you do and what type, um, how you do particular text in particular font, um, and obviously you can always change them as well. Like it's uh, especially when I show you how to set things up in in uh, InDesign. If you set your character and paragraph styles properly, it is very easy to change them if you are not happy with how it's all represented. But um, and at the end of the day, the main thing is be consistent. Whichever font you use, make sure it's the same size, it's the same uh, typeface, and it is the same. Um, it's it, it's all consistent throughout your submissions, just so it's uh, just, just so it looks neat and finished and uh, refined. And the thing I mentioned before about fonts is that you should highlight your uh, keywords, especially when you have large chunks of, chunks of text. So, for example, here is a news article from the school's website, and obviously, if you have something like this in your portfolio, it it is very likely that the person reading it will not read it. Uh, all because they just might not have time to read. Like I'm not saying that um, nobody's going to read it, but what I'm saying is that if there's a large piece of text, it's much easier to get the understanding of what's in the text if you if you highlight 
the stuff you're actually the important stuff in the text. So, for example, this one, which is about um, the school's ranking in the global ranks. If if I had this in my portfolio, for example, um, I would want to highlight the the key points that uh, that have been mentioned. For example, there's top ten. It's ranked eighth in the world and second in the UK. Um, there's stuff about helping professors prospective students, uh, highest academic and research standards, high employability levels, staff excellence, um, and all this other stuff. And even if I haven't read the entire text, I've only read what's in the highlights, I can most likely get the general idea of what's in the text. And th that's a good good thing to use throughout your portfolios as well, because that will allow you to um, it will allow you to communicate larger pieces of text easily with wider audiences who might not always want to read it, but they'll probably look at the highlights, and, and that's how you that's how you will communicate that. Um, and last last thing on color schemes. So it's really important that your work is you ha you show some constraints in how you do your drawings and your diagrams, and having color scheme is one of the ways you can do it. As I showed in the portfolio at the beginning. Um, which had the sort of like blue and pink or magenta colors. And even though it has different types of drawings and different types of diagrams and stuff, it is very, it, it always sticks to the same exact colors, which ends up being, firstly, it, it just looks, it just looks good because it all looks like a refined finished piece of work. Even not, even if some of the diagrams are not the best diagrams out there, as a whole, as a portfolio, it looks refined and also it identifies, uh, to me, it sticks in my memory as like, oh yeah, that was in that particular portfolio because it's not all over the place in terms of colors. I can, I can look at the page and I will be like, okay, yeah, these guys did it because, because it's, um, it's consistent and it, it it kind of gives it your your own branding, your own personality, and the same with the the fonts you choose and the other elements of design you might choose. It's, it's really to make sure that it's it's about your own yourself and your project as a brand. Um, imagine when you're going through some. Um, some websites of stuff being sold, like, I don't know, like, uh, like, let's say clothing brand, you will always see that there is, you know, consistency again in, like, fonts and there's, uh, colors and stuff they use in the website, and it's, it's basically the same idea behind your portfolio, that you have, that you have your consistency and you have your branding, and it, it makes people remember exactly you and your portfolio. Um, and if you struggle to find a color scheme that you like, obviously, again, as I said, you can, you can always change them, but, there are tools online to try to try this. If you just Google color scheme generator or something like that, you, it will probably come up. So I put um, a link in there for for one of those. Um, and it, or if you go on Pantone, for example, which is uh, which designs so they said the color of the year kind of thing, and they do offer color schemes as well. So for example, here this is one I just uh, copied from the website. Uh, the classic blue was the color of the year, I believe, this year. And obviously with this color they have created the colors that they think go together. And um, as general rule of thumb, I would say stick to a maximum of three colors for the entire portfolio. As I showed you in, in the example at the beginning, there was um, two main colors and it was complemented with black, which is, by the way, also a color. Um, and instead of adding more colors, you can always experiment with line weights and line types and fills versus voids and negative spaces and that kind of stuff. And to finish up this presentation, remember that rules can be broken. It doesn't always, you don't always need to follow the stuff I've said to you. The stuff I've said here is the very general basic introduction of some principles, but it is always, it's, it's your portfolio, it's your work. You, you, you need to take ownership of that and you can always, if you think something looks better, even though it goes exactly against what I've said, just do it, go for it. Um, yeah, follow your instincts, and obviously I would not normally recommend this kind of a font in your portfolio, but if you think that's what sells your work best, if you think it goes with your with your theme, just, just be bold and go with it. And uh, last but not least, check what you've been asked to do, because this presentation was done for the entire school as a general, general introduction to where to start, and if you are not sure about something, always check with your own tutors or your le year leads and make sure that um, that actually what you have asked uh, asked to do is not so very contradictory of what I've told you to do and make sure you follow what's exactly uh, fitting to your course. And as I said, if you disagree with something I've said, feel free to do it. Feel free to do it your way. This presentation was as an introduction to people who might not know where to start and hopefully you it, it helps you to do better portfolios. So thank you, and if you have any questions, you can always uh, message me, email me, and so on. And